Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's always a wonderful opportunity to talk, to, talk about architecture uh, for me. So without further ado, I have a lot of material to cover in a, uh, in a very uh, relatively brief period of time. So if you don't mind, I'll just launch right into this. Um, if you're asked to uh, come up with what are the issues in architecture today, contemporary issues, I'm sure each one of you would have a, a different list. And um, uh, my own list would probably run to about 100 topics, but I decided to, um, to shorten it to the ones that I think are most germane to the topics I'm gonna to be talking about. Um, these are positivism, commodification, the environment, authenticity, phenomenology, identity, materiality, critical regionalism, and urbanism in global cities. Um, I've actually then thought about how that relates to what we're, what we're looking at today, especially in the kingdom. And I then uh, separated them out into uh, kind of a, a confrontational or, or dialectic. In other words, technological imperative uh, and commodification against the other seven. <laughs> Uh, the environment, authenticity, phenomenology, identity, and so on. So without further ado, we'll launch right into it. I, I think on the one side, technological imperative, what I call technological determinism has been growing in, in, uh, in our world since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, at least the Industrial Revolution in the West, which dates back to, believe it or not, about 1712 uh, with Newcomen's engine in England when that was invented. Um, it moved in architectural terms from the arts and crafts movement, which was really still based in historical models um, in terms of its inspiration. Charles Rennie McIntosh, Glasgow School of Art, um, it's considered the first modern building, to be honest, and it has a lot of elements of that, industrial materials, uh, glass windows, but it also relates to historical typologies. And we move forward with the Crystal Palace in 1851, by Joseph Paxton, which is a celebration of technology, and the Gallery of Machines in Paris soon after that, which was also a celebration of technology and industrial might, uh, through to the high modernism of the 1920s in Corbusier, Ville Savoie, which is the paradigmatic example of, of high modernism. And then Mies van der Rohe, uh, the Barcelona Pavilion, which is essentially a celebration of German excellence in, in architecture. You know, most world fairs, you go to pavilions and they they celebrate things about the country, um, whatever, whatever characteristics. And it's interesting that he chose excellence in design. And if you've, if you've owned a German car or you've driven in one, you know how well that's turned out for the Germans. It's very good. Uh, so this was codified in a series of books, Pevsner and Banham. And then we move into the 1950s and early 60s, where we have a shift into postmodernism. Robert Venturi talks about complexity and contradiction being more interesting than modernist minimalism. And we then had some really um, excessive examples of uh, architects that caused a lot of consternation among modernists. Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia. There were some good, good examples, uh, Paolo Perzeghese's uh, Roman Mosque, Mosque in Rome, which is inspired by um, Baroque examples, which in turn were inspired by Islamic examples. Um, but there were very few and far between. By, 19, by the 2000s, Charles Jenks did this uh, diagram just before he died in 2001, and it shows that we had in the past in architecture many different movements, but we had movements. We had a, an idea of positions and manifestos and, and all of that. We don't have that anymore in architecture. There's a great deal of confusion about where we're headed and what we're doing. The last of these movements that we can identify, deconstructivism, which is very confusing to a lot of people. I remember when I first came out, um, you know, I, uh, students came up to me, I was teaching in Texas at that time. They said, what's this all about? You know, what's deconstructivism? Can you explain it to me? We're, st we're still trying to figure it out, but I'll explain it as best I can. All of these were generated by the press and the media. Pa uh, Andreas Papadakis, who ran Academy Editions, was a, an ex-boss of mine essentially was good at packaging these things and promoting them. Jacques Derrida was the uh, instigator of deconstructivism, which can be described very briefly as the idea of a binary oppositions in philosophy and Western philosophy, where he started to question text and written word and, and question it and put it under interrogation. 
to the extent where the author, the writer of that text, writers of that text became questioned. And the bottom line for architecture is the human being is erased entirely from the technological model. So we have examples very briefly, Bernard Schumi, uh, Parc de la Vallette, uh, where essentially machines replace greenery and trees. And this is an example of what I think of as what happens when technology wins and nature is gone for good. You know, the, the French government really, uh, it, it seems as if they didn't really understand what this project was, was doing. They thought they would have grass and trees and all the usual things you have in parks instead of steel uh, buildings replacing trees. And it was quite a shock, you know, when it was finally finished. These have no function. It's a perfect example of kind of like modern emptiness. And then we have the, the latest trend of deconstructivism in the, in the 90s and 2000s, um, Musée de Confluence uh, by Kupilmoblau, for example, when, as I said, you know, what happens when human beings are also erased and architecture takes over and technology dominates. Um, we, uh, as I began to teach this over 40 years, I came up with uh, a revelation when I read this book, uh, Long Wave Cycle, Nikolai uh, Kondratev, um, uh, Long Wave Cycles, which was actually also elaborated upon by Schumpeter. And I found it fascinating that the long wave cycles that Kondratev talks about, and there are six of these over time, starting with the Industrial Revolution and up till today, they coincide almost exactly with architectural movements. So you have the arts and crafts movement, high modernism, postmodernism, deconstructivism, all aligning with each one of these waves, which indicates to me that there's a technological imperative or determinism going on, which uh, it doesn't mean a, a break in each movement, it means a continuity. So we have what I look at as the first modernism, fixed rules, mutual engagement, strong institutions, um, class, neighborhood and family, strong, time and space, strong. Panopticon, society, critical theory is very strong, revolving around social injustice issues. And a telos, a, a direction. We were on a ship and we kind of knew where we were going. Progress was going to lead us into the future and create a better world. But the stage was set also at this time for a disembedding from traditional societies. The second modernism that we are in and actually moving out of now uh, is fluid with zombie institutions, radical change in social conditions, a post-panopticon, synopticon society. And I love this, I love this one because synopticon means that instead of uh, the few observing the many, as it is in the panopticon society, synopticon society is the many observing the few, which finally results in cancel culture. We have the end of mutual engagement, critical theory being dead. Um, that's an argument from critical theorists out there. Flexism and the end of that telos, the end of a, an idea of the future. So fluid modernity is disengagement, elusiveness, facile escape, slippage, elision, and avoidance. Commodification, one of the best books I've ever read and, and I, I hold dear to it is Postmodernism by J Frederick Jameson. I know we all think of postmodernism as an architectural style that's really uh, questionable, but it's actually a social condition. And he says something, I'm gonna be reading some quotes in the beginning here, but we won't go through this kind of thing in the end. These will be setting the stage. Uh, he said, what happened in that aesthetic production today has become in integrated into commodity production generally. The frantic economic urgency of producing fresh waves of ever more novel seeming goods uh, now assigns an increasingly essential structural function and position to aesthetic innovation and experimentation. What that means is, in, in short, architecture has been commodified. We're now dealing with object buildings that are produced like a product. Um, another very important build, book that I, I recommend to you if you haven't read it, it was recommended to me by my older son who's much, much smarter than I am, is uh, Liquid Modernity. I'm gonna be reading some quotes from this because they help us. Uh, he said, everything in a consumer society is a matter of choice, except the compulsion to choose, which becomes like an addiction. Consumerism is no longer about satisfying self-identity, but about insatiable desire. A high percentage of corporate production today, time and cost involves creating fantasies that fulfill expectations. Individual expresses him or herself through possessions. And this relates directly to architecture. Given the profusion of tempting offers, the attraction of any commodity is rapidly exhausted. So life decisions today are regarded as a consumer choice. Freedom to treat life as one protracted shopping spree 
The world is viewed as a warehouse overflowing with consumer commodities. Postmodern society, very important quote. Postmodern society engages its members primarily in their capacity as consumers rather than producers. This may explain why we don't have any, more Mo any Mozarts anymore and people and artists are, are just simply recycling old, old uh, art. Living in a world full of opportunities with each one more appetizing than the rest and providing grounds for shifting toward the next is an exhilarating experience. In such a world, little is predetermined or irre irrevocable. Few defeats are final. Few mishaps are irreversible. No victory is ultimate either. For possibilities to remain infinite, none may be allowed to become a lasting reality. There is no such thing as a lasting achievement. Young people are now faced with the impossibility of gratification. Identity today is not a given, but a task. They must find it and create it. Their future is formed and negotiable. Life is now adapting to systemic contradiction. And lastly, I would add also from Anthony Giddens, modern life is mediated by electronic images. We respond to everything as if we're being recorded. There is no collective narrative. Self-revelation gives the appearance of authenticity. The right to choose is now more important than what is chosen. If the Titanic were to sink today, this is what would probably happen. Uh, people would be taking selfies of the ship uh, as it went down. Um, so I'm gonna race through some of these, of these issues, and if you excuse me if I'm galloping through them, but um, I think they're all important, but they deserve more time. But I'm hoping this will be disseminated to all of you so you can actually look at it in, in your leisure. So sustainability is a, um, is a word we hear a lot about, and I'd like to uh, just basically, essentially, shortly talk about what, what, what it was, uh, how did it start, uh, how did it end, what's replaced it, and what are the current trends. And these uh, six trends, I'll go through them very quickly, uh, and then look at a case study of, um, of one architect. Um, it really started with the moonshot in 1969 when, as someone mentioned at that time, we discovered the Earth by looking back at it, by leaving it. I remember, I'm, you're looking at a living fossil up here. I'm old enough to remember uh, the first Earth Day when I remember in Philadelphia, everyone was very excited and they all filled the streets and marched and there was a lot of excitement about the world being able to be changed. Now we, we, we don't even recognize Earth Day. It comes, it goes, but nobody really pays attention. Uh, the first people to really talk about anything related to sustainability were the group of, uh, uh, the, the Club of Rome, excuse me, the Limits to Growth, where they began to say, we better start cutting back. And then we had the first United Nations conference in 1972 in Stockholm, uh, which was the, guided toward the idea of sustainability. It really took its definition from um, Gro Harlem Brundtland in 1983 when she defined it as meeting the needs of today without sacrificing the, the, the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That was the definition that she came up with, and that's the, the standing definition of sustainability. It was refined in 1992 at Rio, uh, where they tried to drill down on what needs really means in terms of a world where there's uh, income inequality. And there were two principles out of that conference that I think uh, were very, very um, meaningful. One was the role of women in development, and the other was the uh, belief in indigenous technology, indigenous knowledge, which was a huge thing, I think, recognizing that it's more than just a romantic vision of the past tradition. It can teach us things. And, but in spite of the, uh, all these conferences, global temperatures began to kept rising, and we know that they're still rising. This only takes us up to 2017, but we know that today it continues, that chart continues up. There were 17 major conferences from 1972, the Stockholm Conference, until 2022. And none of them have been able to stop the, the disaster that's happening to our planet. And so this has led to um, a, a, an enormous shift, especially recognizable in America, where you have um, political activism taking over because the young people there realize that nothing has worked and they want to take uh, the helm. Um, so with their recognition that perhaps capitalism itself is the villain here that needs to be addressed. And so the game has changed for architects. Young people are now taking matters into their own hands and they're not waiting for institutional change. They're taking, uh, taking the helm. Uh, we have people like Greta Thunberg who I think she always reminds me of someone who's perpetually angry, you know, but she's angry at the fact that her future is being taken away from her. And she wants to, uh, she wants authorities and institutions to step up 
and do what they have to do to make, make the changes necessary. And so this in America has now caused a rift. You know, we have the political left and the political right, and this is partially the reason for it, this awareness by young people of environmental degradation. So what are the trends related to that that supersede or come on from sustainability? Resilience is one of these, which is really like what I call uh, the power of embracing failure. Uh, sustainability is tied to the world, where sustainability tried to bring the world into balance, resilience now tries to manage an imbalanced world. It's saying things are not gonna get better, let's just deal with it and try to create a, an alternative. And so we find all these things that we know about. When I first started talking about this in 1990s, believe it or not, as I said, I'm a living fossil up there, um, people were still questioning whether this was true. Is climate change really true? Now it's not considered to be a, a, a question anymore. So all these things you know about, the ice cap melting, uh, the ice cap dramatically melting, and the glaciers melting, the sea levels rising, but nobody kind of really typically understands how much. If you look at the diagrams, even these are conservative of the land mass around the coastlines in the world that will be lost. Um, in, in America, this will be disastrous, and insurance rates are rising <laughs> dramatically along the coast uh, because of this. Um, New York especially will be hit if you look at what might happen there. Architects are looking at uh, Induce, introducing measures that will stop that, but it's, it's kind of like too little too late. The one that worries me the most, to be honest, is the vanishing ice cap in the Himalayas where we have two rivers coming out into India, you know, the Indus, the Indus and the Ganges, and five rivers coming out on the other side in China, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, the Pearl River, and so on, can be dried up entirely in probably in your lifetime. Um, so water scarcity will affect about 1.8 billion people. It's not a very a good scenario um, with 36 countries involved. And so uh, a friend of mine, Ismail Siragaldin, uh, once told me he was the head of sustainability at the World Bank for a while. And he said, James, you know, if you, if you want to be rich in the future, you should start stockpiling water. <laughs> he said, buy a warehouse and put barrels of water in there. Um, another trend is biomimicry, acting like uh, plants and animals do to survive in the environment. I recommend uh, this uh, TED Talk to you, Janine ben, Russ, ben Yes, excuse me. It's one of the best examples of um, biomimicry I've found. And also biophilic synergy, which simply means living with natural systems. Uh, natural and social economic resources is another trend. Um, rainforest depletion is one of these. We all know the example of that. I spend a lot of time in Malaysia, and I uh, can tell you that it's it's really heartbreaking to see all the hardwood forests being cut down illegally there and sold on the black market. It, it's, it's depleting that forest there. And we see that, although it, it spiked in, um, in 2009, 2009, it went down with the new administration. It's on its way back up there. Another economic model I constantly refer my students to is the microcredit uh, phenomenon it was started by Muhammad Yunus in the sense of empowering people, even with small loans in underdeveloped world to, to take charge of their own life. Um, so we, we must move from a linear economy to a circular economy where you have a recycling of resources and not just a simple throughput. Um, I won't go through all of these because of time, but these are for your viewing pleasure later when you see this online or somewhere. These are some of the trends in uh, socioeconomic systems that's, that that are now taking over from sustainability. Uh, political ecology, ecological economics, these are areas that are actually being taught as majors in courses in America. And so they're, they're taking on new, um, new importance. An, old, an oldie but a goodie, uh, Edward Masria, 1970s, passive solar. Even though we think, oh, that's old, old school, that's, that's common knowledge. You'd be amazed how many architects ignore this, uh, this common um, technique. And lastly, I recommend this book to you, which changed my life, and it was a professor that changed my life at Penn, um, who began to recognize that the world isn't one big climate, it's a microclimate situation where you have to, you have to really um, uh, adhere to that. Um, a friend of mine, Ken Yang, um, has, is an example because I think he shows us the power of imagination in dealing with pragmatics, dealing with things as they are, not as you want them to be. You know, we may, we, we may want the car to go away, but it won't. We may want 
traffic to go away, but it won't. We may want airplanes to go away, but they won't. Um, and he's saying we may want skyscrapers to go away, but they won't. So let's make them more sustainable, more green, and, and try to change the typology by making them um, relate to that. This is a, a building in Malaysia which is fully uh, ventilated, naturally ventilated, not air conditioned, no air conditioning at all. If you've been to Malaysia, you know. That's a very bold step. It's a very humid country. Um, and then he talks about taking green up into buildings uh, to make them um, greener. greener. His, his work is characterized by a great deal of scientific investigation and research, which makes it really um, uh, very believable. And his latest building, the, the Singapore Library, follows these uh, examples. The next issue is authenticity, the degree to which a person's, a person's actions are congruent with his or her values, desires, and so on. And um, James Clifford has addressed this in his wonderful book. And he talks about, I won't read the quote directly, I'll just say that, you know, in academic circles, we've been talking for a long time about the dichotomy between uh, tradition and, and modernism. This debate has taken over many conferences, and I can't tell you how many times I've been involved in this. But what he's saying is very wonderful. He says, rather than seeing history as a process in which authenticity of culture, places, and people and products are endangered by modernizing influences, we should consider that it is one in which cult cultural artifacts shape hybrid meaning. So this comes into play when we start to talk about how do we in reinterpret Najdi architecture, for example, into the current, uh, and current uh, lexicon, because uh, these shifting processes need to be taken into account. And then we also, in authenticity, look at examples like this, the KAFD mosque uh, by Umrania. You know, what, what are we to make about this, make of this uh, in, in its style? It has two minarets, we can, we can recognize that, but it's not a, uh, an image we normally assume to be a mosque. These uh, digital diagrams show this transition in, from the inspiration, which was a, a, a desert flower, a sand flower, into a mosque. And so my question, I guess, is um, we can use digital technology, but now that we have it, uh, how can we use it? How should we use it? Because it's so facile and easy to use, is it appropriate to use it in, in ways that are not following traditional methods? And I think this, this example raises that question. There are many more uh, examples like this. Um, on the other hand, we have a traditional example like the Al-Kharaj Mosque by, uh, by Rasam Badran, uh, where you have a typical hypostyle mosque with skylights. Um, and this reminds me that nearby this mosque, just recently, I mean within two years, there was a, an archaeological discovery of a, a mosque very early in the history of Islam, you know, within one or two years of the beginning of the faith that had um, a, a court and a hypostyle hall. And I think that these, these typologies need to be honored. Uh, they need to be sustained rather than, than completely wiped away. We have phenomenology uh, as another of these issues. Uh, Alberto Perez Gomez is a hero, I think, uh, who describes this. I'm gonna read his quote kind of thoroughly because it involves all the things we'll see after that, which I'll gallop through fast. So he says, design is a story we tell ourselves. These stories should be, they should include history and context and are always changing. We must recreate them at every moment because understanding is a matter of interpretation, because conceptual skills and background are very much part of our perception, which is never passive. We weave them in the present through our own experience, and we must do this with humility in an exchange with culture in which we expect to build. To achieve a genuine dialogue, it's important to achieve a fusion of horizons. I love that term. We should seek basic strategies for poetic inhabitation in the artifacts of history that constitute our background and those for whom we build. The best works of architecture have historically been, had broad and deep cultural roots in space and time, and not just one singular meaning as an object building. And examples of this, uh, examples of these would be the Jean de Jean Museum by Xu Pei, recently completed uh, in that city, which uh, commemorates or memorializes the fact that Ming pottery was made there, the clay and the site was was uh, used to create the pottery, which was uh, fired in kilns that look like that. Uh, and it's a beautiful building that takes advantage of the local clay, the local material, to create a, a memory of what was there in the past. And also his Dali Art Museum, which is 
uh, honoring the, the nearby temple, uh, the pagoda nearby, by, by burying itself in the hillside uh, to be unobtrusive. We also have identity, and some people in the audience might roll their eyes, you know, that I'm going into something that's very familiar to me, but I'll, I'll gallop through his work. Um, if, if you were asked, he became famous because of this book, Architecture for the Poor, which I find many students still don't know about. Even in Egypt, I just taught there for a year. And you mentioned this book in his name, and many, many students and, and even faculty don't know who he is, which is phenomenal to me. But I'll just say this about him. Uh, I spent a lot of my life examining and researching him. If you were asked uh, today, if someone came up to you and said, will you please design a building in, in, in uh, let's say, some country you've never been to, and you had to uh, assimilate the culture, what process would you use to do that in a sensitive way as about Alberto Perez Gomez mentions? How would you do it? And I think he tried to do that for his own country. And so he examined uh, existing cultural artifacts there, the uh, buildings in Islamic Cairo. Um, he did surveys of them at a time in the 1930s when people weren't doing that. He surveyed them um, very carefully and, and examined typologies. He found typologies that were reproduced. There were at that time maybe 15 to 20 of these old buildings, but now uh, there are just a handful, few, a handful, three or four. And so he, he used all these typologies and he combined them with a Nubian construction system. These are, uh, these pictures, photographs are by him, by the way, the following pictures of, of a visit he took to Nubia and he saw the construction system they used and he decided to combine these two into a language of architecture. And so um, he used this uh, combined with other things that he studied, Fatimid ma mausoleums, um, um, necropolis, a Christian necropolis in the desert, uh, vaults by Ramesses Temple in Egypt. Um, and he came up with a, a style of his own in 1937. He started to implement this. One of his first houses is the uh, Nasser, uh, Hamdi Saf al Nasser house in the Fayyum, 1943. And then, of course, his most famous project was Old Gorna, to re recreate that in a new village. This is the only part of that that was built. This was the original master plan. He was only able to, to actually realize about one-fifth of it. And this is uh, his picture of the construction system that, that was used at that time. And this is a picture of the very young Hassan Fatih uh, at, uh, at 43 years old crossing the Nile you know, toward his, his masterpiece. Um, it was a stage set, there's no question. It was, it was too uh, pristine to be real, and as it turned out, not very pragmatic. Um, he followed local models um, and basically created uh, a masterpiece that's now disappearing. It's now almost gone. He then changed to a stone architecture for reasons that had to do with the scarcity of mud brick, and he, he showed that uh, those principles can be transferred to another kind of masonry. This is Baris, which I consider to be his masterpiece. You know, this is hugely contemporary, very modern in its look. You know, it, 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 it's traditionally based, but it's very contemporary. Very contemporary. Uh, his last project was Dar al Islam in America in Abiquiu, New Mexico. Um, we also have his followers very quickly, Abdul Wahid a very young looking Abdul Wahid Wakil on the left and a very happy Abdul Wahid Wakil on the right, just because he's just received the Dry House Prize for his a body of achievement, his remarkable body of achievement. He started out with a house in Egypt, the Halawa House, which got him recognized by the Aga Khan, and then he did 13 to 15 major buildings, in, mostly in the kingdom, but outside in Bahrain and other places, uh, which have yet to be uh, sufficiently documented, and they await their, um, their biographer. Uh, I think he is a remarkable architect. He's, a, he's the contemporary equivalent of Michelangelo, in my view. But, you know, talking about authenticity, he was very much inspired by Egyptian examples. You know, uh, his, his uh, island mosque was uh, uh, using the Jiushi Mosque in Cairo as a model. That mosque has now been restored, although tourists can't go up there on the Makatam Hills because it's a militarily sensitive site. And yet, uh, I'm not sure why they restored it and don't allow tourists up there. But essentially, this was his, uh, his precedent for the island mosque. And you can see it's almost directly a copy of it. Um, his uh, Corniche mosque also uses Hassan Fati's 
Ham, uh, Hamid's, Hamdi House, sorry, Hamid House, as a Hamid Said House, I'll get this right. Hamid Said House as a model. And Ruiz Mosque uses um, Baris as a model. So this raises that issue of authenticity as well, um, which I mentioned earlier. The favorite for me is the Mikat Mosque, which I had the privilege to visit uh, recently. And I think he uses the uh, Tulanid model and also the Samara model in the, in the building, which is brilliant, uh, brilliant building. And then he did private homes, one in Jeddah for um, uh, Suleiman family. Um, Rasam Badran, to me, follows the Alberto Perez Gomez model because his work is heuristic. He looks at the context, he researches deeply, he does deep studies, and then he transforms that as he did at the Museum of Modern Islamic Art in, in Doha, which was not realized. I am pay one the competition. But uh, he, he, uh, his model was, I think, superior, to be honest. The final result speaks for itself. It's contemporary on the one hand. It's based in tradition on the other hand. It's historical, but it's also highly, highly modern. Uh, Abdul Halim Ibrahim, uh, recently deceased, very powerful force. They were partners, actually, on several projects, Rasan Badran and uh, Ibrahim. He used the model of Islamic Cairo as the typology for the AUC University, where the main street is, um, is modeled after the main street through Islamic Cairo, and you have hierarchy of spaces using convective cooling as an example, and it works very well. The only criticism I would have of this is the scale. Um, and then we have Salima Naji, who I'm researching recently, uh, just at the moment writing about her. She's a Moroccan architect who follows an example of Hassan Fatih and others. Uh, her major contribution, however, is in restoration, which is very important for the environment because it doesn't use new materials, but recycles old ones. She's now working on the granaries, which are sacred sites throughout Morocco, and she's almost single-handedly restoring all of them. She's an amazing, I, I, uh, one of my heroes. She's very, very energetic. Um, materiality, we see uh, previously uh, validated materials like cement and concrete and steel and aluminum and all that being highly uh, unsustainable because of their BTU content. And so we have a whole generation now looking toward rammed earth, which prior to this was not even considered to be a viable material in, in architecture. Tatiana Bobao is one of these. Um, Luis T uh, Pere Pereira in, in Brazil is one of these. Uh, Wendell Burnett is one of these architects. Rick Joy has made beautiful architecture out of rammed earth. And so they're validating this, this material, which is now coming into its own. Uh, and Tom Kunding, as well, is doing that. This is a cultural center in Canada, MKIP, which is designed by the local indigenous tribe there. Uh, and also in materiality, we have Wang Shu, who's showing us the way with this building, the Ningbao Museum. He won the Pritzker Prize recently for this. I think it was primarily because of this building. He's making a statement about the use of waste material from construction or destruction in China and, and making a statement about the old transferring up into the new. And um, this is the rubble that was on the site from the city that was destroyed, the traditional city of Ningba. He was making a statement about it. And believe it or not, all of these diagrams, all of these patterns are actually worked out on working drawings by his staff. And then they're implemented by craftspeople on the site. This is almost incredible to imagine, but in China, this is possible. You know, you say, put that piece of brick there, <laughs> and, and they do it. Um, another another uh, principle, sorry, another um, movement I want to mention today as a, an issue is the rise of critical regionalism once again. It started in 1973, uh, and it was heightened by Fr Kenneth Frampton at that time, who wrote a brilliant piece about it, critical regionalism and he characterized it as an architectural resistance against Western domination. Uh, there are other four, five others very quickly I'll look at here. Alvar Alto is obviously doing this kind of style um, and using local materials in a, very, in, in a, in a way that's uh, sustainable. Um, Balkrishna Doshi, wonderful man who, very humble man in spite of all his achievements. He started out with a, uh, a basis in Corbusier. He worked for Corbusier for five years and now he's transferred that into his own style. Uh, Rafael Moneo, who is, uh, I'm getting a reminder that, I'm, that, I'm, that I should hurry up. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll flash forward. Um, 
let's flash forward to, um, no, no need. Let's flash forward to the end here. I have some discussion, five minutes, if you give me five minutes. Kamsa Shigai, Yanni. Um, I'll, I'll uh, go through some examples in the kingdom very quickly. Um, I think the historical center, Abdulaziz, is a good example of uh, public uh, architecture that meets a need. Uh, the public realm is, is, is finished in the West. There's no more public realm. But there is here because I, I found in my research, because of the inclusion of a mosque in, in many public spaces, which activates the space and gives it meaning. You know, the, the West is now very secular. It's moving away from spirituality. And this is the reason why the public realm is now dead. But here it's alive. And this, this project I love because it's the past calling across this open space to the future. Um, and it has gateways. Kasar al Hokam, you all know really well. I would argue that this is uh, one of Rasim Badran's masterpieces. He was able to find old photographs, and, um, and this inspired him a lot in terms of the bridge he used. And we find that the alignment with the uh, Musmak Fort being very, very important here in the building and the open spaces. Um, and the diplomatic quarter where we are. Uh, uh, where we're based, uh, us who, some of us who teach here, uh, that was based on a new urbanist model. My, my realization living there now is quite interesting because I realized that it wasn't um, implemented in quite the way it was intended. It, it, it was intended to bring convective cooling up from the Wadi Hanifa to bring it in through these gaps in the fingers into the middle, but it doesn't quite work that way because the architecture is kind of solid. Um, and... I'll flash forward. I think this is a great example of Salmania architecture in the sense that it's, it's contemporary, but it's also very traditional. And Atarif, you know about, um, Rasam Badran is very proud of this new building he did there, uh, which surrounds a mosque in the middle of the, of the Wahab Foundation, which has these two ramp foundations on either side, uh, looking out into the old, from the new into the old. And Al Daho, which uh, is an extremely interesting project because it preserves the past and, and adds to it. But I, I would argue that it falls into the category of commodification that I started out with, where it tries to use tradition, traditional forms, in a way that uh, will, will derive tourist dollars from it. But extremely hard to, to do this because of saving the old fabric. It's actually 15 square blocks and includes cultural facilities, mosques, uh, restaurants, hotels, and uh, restaurants, as I mentioned, and residential units. Um, but it is certainly not a, an Islamic city or village in the traditional sense described by, for example, Jamil Akbar or Bessie Nakim. Lastly, but not least, we, we talked about this in the, in the green room outside about Zahir Hadid and, and the new metro stations. Two metro stations very quickly, and then I'll shut up. Um, essentially, um, this one, which if you read the description by the architect, She's, I shouldn't speak badly of the departed, but she said that um, it was inspired by the sounds of metros going through stations all over the world, Paris, New York, various places, that they recorded these and then they, they made this building out of, the, uh, out of the tracking of that. So I ask you, as I did with the KAFD mosque, you know, we have the digital technology, we can use it, but are we using it in the appropriate way? And she also uh, cites Mashrabiya, you know, but the interior of this is certainly far away from, uh, from an Islamic building, let's face it. And then lastly, I just learned a, a, a phrase, I'm not going to pronounce it well, I, as I said, I taught in Egypt for the last uh, year. And the students there use this phrase like, begat, like really? Seriously? <laughs> you look at this building and you think, this is Saudi Arabia, you know, where uh, the temperatures can rise to 52 degrees in the summer and, and you create a stainless steel disk. Uh, in the middle. Um, I have to say that it's very uh, clever, however. Snow Hatta did a very clever thing. You know, can you imagine approaching this on a hot summer day? You know, you, you'd be baked by the time you got to the metro. Um, but they are very clever in reflecting uh, what's below it, which are the Najdi style walls in the lower level, up to the public on the top. So in a way, it acts like a periscope. Um, and I won't go into this in great detail, but um, that's the end of my, my lecture. Thank you very much. I guess I should ask for questions, right? Questions. Any questions or comments?
Thank you, Professor Steele, for this interesting journey through the different areas of architecture and um, linking all to local identity and to the question of circular economy. And that without embedding identity into contemporary architecture, then there is no way forward. So, any questions to Professor Steele? Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Wow, it was very enriching and very intellectual. And um, I guess I'm very interested in new urbanism and how it, you know, new, new uh, neighborhoods and new cities, especially even in the States, they are developing to be, become more walkable and uh, more approachable with the, through different age groups. And I guess my question would be, with all the, the amazing things that are happening now in Saudi Arabia, you know, with uh, what's happening in Al Bajiri, uh, a very historical area, and they are trying to renovate it to make it more modern, what do you think would be, um, how can we connect the concepts of new urbanism with historical areas such as Al Bajiri or Tref, or even the older parts of Riyadh, such as Al uh, Murabba and all these, um, um, you know, uh, locations. I think uh, this project uh, tried to do that. You know, they, they tried to use that, those concepts. Um, and those, those principles basically have to do with what you just mentioned, walkability, the humanization of the city, as Prince Ayaf talks about, um, and, and has performed well, you know, in his role as a mayor. Um, what and what so, would be ideas about, like, the in relation to the weather that we have, with the harsh weather that we have, yeah. what would be suggestions that you would uh, recommend for such areas to be more walkable, more approachable by different age groups? And uh, Yeah, and well, we have examples uh, from traditional architecture and models in, in Morocco and Tunisia and so on, where you have the cafes, the shade structures, which by their very nature can cool the temperatures down 10 degrees in either direction. So shade, you know, the sun is an enemy and, and shade is the, uh, the answer. And so just shading these streets and, and orientation is ma maximum. We talked about um, Abdul Halim Ibrahim, who organized the main street in AUC so that the sun is, is never directly on you as you walk through there, which is a traditional idea from Old Cairo. So just uh, an awareness of indigenous, indigenous principles is extremely important. And it's very missing in our education system, trust me. You know, very, very rarely taught in studios. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Halas? Okay. I have one question. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you have rightly mentioned, the issue of uh, having now metro stations, and as we all know, around metro stations, we have all the transit-oriented development uh, rules and regulations that have to be followed from densification to high-rise buildings to all the different uses and users that have to be introduced around those metro stations. So uh, we are faced with the controversy of all the land speculation that could happen around those metro stations. And the fact that we will, whether we want or not, we will have to obey those rules of uh, economic pressures. And how do you go around that? That's a, by I think, a, by I think, applying you know, all these traditional architectural low-rise uh, buildings within yeah. those constraints. I think we could organize a symposium or a conference around this question <laughs> because it's a big one and it takes days to try to unpack that, right? And there's no answer that I know of except um, it, in my suspicion, it, it doesn't relate to object buildings that are expressive of somebody's ego. It, it relates to following traditional um, um, patterns, traditional principles, indigenous wisdom that can still follow that and be modern and be technological and adopt all those things. I really believe that to be true. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, revolve around somebody beating their chest and say, look at me, how great an architect I am, to make an object building that speaks to their ego. It, it relates around uh, an architecture that satisfies the needs of the people but is environmentally friendly. 
Thank you. Okay, can I have just a very impressive presentation, no doubt. Now we will mention a lot about the challenges in climate change. Is there a regulation to use, use the two options, whether dry construction or wet constructions? And the dry construction is more friend to the environment. What about now the regulation laws in countries that you have to use green concrete for, of course, the uh, environmental issues and the, to, to deal with the environment? So what is now the, when you talk about the dry constructions or, or wet constructions, uh, the difference and why it's not, since we have this urgency, so what is happening today? Uh, what are these now, the, uh, the regulations that are taking place within this respect? Thank That's you. a great question. I, um, I think the industries, industrial materials, uh, concrete, steel, aluminum, you know, titanium, all the rest of them, um, they've realized that they have to do a lot of R&D, a lot of research, to try to make their materials more environmentally friendly. Concrete, for example, is it off-gasses carbon dioxide in a major way, and it keeps doing it for 20 to 30 years after it's placed, you know? It's, a, it's an enormously poisonous material. Um, but the concrete industry realizes that they have to shape up in, and they're doing research now to try to reduce that. So I think that we have to be, as architects, co cognizant and knowledgeable about what the changes are, what the new materials are, how they're changing, and what the, what the um, producers are doing to, to, to make them better. You know, a lot of architects aren't aware of that. So I think that's the answer. It doesn't mean not using them. I think it means using the latest model of them, the latest iteration that's environmentally uh, sensitive and acceptable. It doesn't mean we have to use wood and, and rammed earth for all our buildings, although there is a new high rise made out of wood in New York just going up. But I, I think you're right that you know, we have to uh, accept them, those materials, but we have to make them more, more friendly. They're saying now, in some countries, in France, uh, it is by law. You have to use green concrete for high-rise buildings. Right. That's so, the kind of thing I'm talking about, where you make it you. mandatory to use, uh, you know, the latest material. Guais? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Steele. It's been an honor to welcome you at Prince Sultan University. And um, we look forward maybe to future visits as well. Thank to you To let much. us know what your recent research is, is about. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You very much. Thank you.